and welcome to Food Biz Plus. My name is Kathy Joran, and I'm the director of the Food Business School of the Culinary Institute of America. And uh, please, uh, if you can't hear me or there are any technical difficulties, please uh, let us know in the chat box down below. But uh, I'd love to welcome you again to Food Biz Plus for today. The Food Business School is the Graduate and Executive Center for Education at the Culinary Institute of America. And our mission is to enable and empower our students to design, deliver, and lead transformative innovations that address the world's most pressing food systems challenges and what we also think are its greatest business opportunities. So today we're going to have a conversation with our guest speaker. And I just wanted to let you know that uh, we'll be talking with her for about 40 to 45 minutes and I, I would like to ask you all to stay on for just a few minutes after our conversation ends so that I can tell you a little bit about upcoming programs at the Food Business School. If you have any questions during the conversation you're welcome to type them into the chat section and we'll try to address them as we go forward um, assuming that there's something that's uh, of interest to a larger group. If it's a personal question we might be able to uh, get back to you with an answer on that later but um, please feel free to, to enter questions. Also, uh, we will be sending out a link to the uh, taped version of this session afterwards, probably next week, and you'll be able to access it in the future if you'd like to uh, review it at any time. All right, so let's begin, and I would like to introduce our guest, Debbie Benedetti, for Food Biz Plus Insights for Great Leaders. And Debbie is the founder of Beyond the Possible. She's going and to come on here momentarily with her video and microphone. Hello, Debbie. Hi, microphone. It all worked. That worked. All right. So I can, <laughs> <laughs> I can hear you. It's great. All right. So I'm going to tell the uh, audience here a little bit about you. Debbie is a strategic coach who works with executives, leaders, and entrepreneurs focused on reaching their fullest potential. After 30 30 years in restaurant operations and executive management positions with Saga Corporation, Marriott, and Bon Appetit Management Company, Debbie became an executive coach and consultant in 1999. She dedicates her time to helping individual leaders gain clarity around unrealized goals, leadership transition techniques, and developing personal strategic plans. Debbie works with all levels of leaders who want to improve their personal strength and accelerate their professional effectiveness and results. Her client list spans from CEOs to celebrity chefs. The desire to want, to, to want something more through gaining work-life balance, establishing focused target strategies, and developing in-depth communication skills are just some of the reasons that people seek to work with Debbie. Debbie has been honored with several industry awards and has served on the boards of Women's Food Service Forum, uh, UNLV, which is um, University of Las Vegas, William F. Hera College of Hotel Administration Advisory Board, and Guy Fieri's Cooking with Kids Foundation. During our conversation today, Debbie will share valuable insights into six key attributes of successful leaders, including topics on personal branding and strategic planning, among a few, and how these skills are critical to leading in today's challenging food industry and market. All right. So Debbie, Debbie. <laughs> <I've heard you. laughs> I have heard you described as the CEO whisperer or a career chiropractor. Which of those would you say that you are and what, what do you do that earns you this time? <laughs> well, actually, those were both different introductions people gave about me. And so I always, I always giggle when I hear them. Um, I do work one-on-one -on -one supporting individuals. So I work with a lot of CEOs and, and that just becomes obvious because CEOs really have nowhere to go. They can't very well talk to their board and say, I'm having a problem with this, or I'm thinking about doing this because the board wants to see that confidence. They can't really talk to their direct reports um, because that would, you know, kind of taint where they are as a leader. So 80% of the CEOs in America right now, or in the United States, 
and very similar around the world, do employ executive coaches. Um, and I specifically focus in on the hospitality industry, restaurants, hotels, entrepreneurs, manufacturers, but all around hospitality. Uh, the second part of my business is I work with people who are going through career transition. Uh, and I love to say either voluntarily or involuntarily. Um, and it could be almost any level, but it's when people are sitting there and all of a sudden they know they need to change their job or somebody has helped them identify that they need to change their job. And it's it, you feel like a fish out of water. Uh, and I think that most, I mean, I'll never forget having to interview uh, for the first time in 30 years. And it just seemed very strange. So I work with individuals and in supporting them to first identify what their ideal looks like and then how to attract that ideal career. So people choose to work with executive coaches because they're in a transition? Um, I like when people ask me who are your ideal clients, I usually just say people who are ready to do their work. So we all, as individuals, hit different developmental stages, different times in our careers, different transitions. Um, and to use an executive coach to be your accountability partner and help you through that transition makes it much more um, accountable, makes it much more real. It's up to the person to be to do the work and right. ready to do the work. Right. Afterwards. Yeah. And so, why do people choose you as, a, <laughs> as a, your? As well, a it's it's uh, it's interesting because uh, my website says very clearly I work in the hospitality industry, but people leave the hospitality industry. So I have also worked in software development groups. I've also worked with uh, insurance groups because leadership. And, and individual development is um, transitions any, any specific area. People first come to me though, because they know I work with people in the hospitality industry. I understand their language. I understand the pitfalls. I understand the challenges. I understand the excitement of delivering great food and service. And do you get most of your clients through word of mouth recommendations or how do people find Yes, them? it's, uh, uh, I, I've been very blessed. I, I started my coaching business and I uh, have never really marketed myself. I have a website um, and so some people may find that, but not many, maybe five a year. And at any given time, I'm working with 20 to 25 clients. And so it's, it shows you. And, and the average time that I work with a client is around three months. That really is identify what they want to work on, help them work on it, and then develop an action plan to take them through. Um, CEOs tend to be uh, evergreen. In other words, I work with CEOs the whole almost indefinitely there we do like a monthly tuna and um, uh -huh. and it really depends it's really on their schedule and what they're looking for so um, you typically work primarily with CEOs but you also work with leaders at right, other levels right. right people who are looking to move up and so your typical client can be you know a wide variety of levels of yeah looking to improve or advance yeah their and careers. again it's it's people who want to do their work so sometimes I'm hired by I would say 50 percent of the time I'm hired by individuals where they just call up and they say I've heard about you here's what I'm dealing with right now I'd like to work with you and then we we just do an hour kind of interview of what is it they really are trying to accomplish am I a right match the cool thing about coaches is that you aren't a match for everybody. And so the match really has to come with for the client. Does that client think that 
that you are hearing them, that you are listening to what their challenges are, does the client feel comfortable with you? And that, so it's a big piece about building trust. Um, so I've worked with everybody from uh, general managers to CEOs, from uh, prep people or, or sous chefs to celebrity chefs. And it's often people say, well, what, who do you work with? And I say everybody from startups to Starbucks. And, uh, and uh, it, it really is that kind of breadth and depth. And um, it's fun because the process always starts the same way. What are they trying to achieve? What do they want? What's their goal? And then we develop a plan on how to get them there. That makes sense. And like in any coaching or counseling situation, it always has to be a match in personality and right. process. Right. right. So those are the people who call me and want to hire me individually. But then I also have about five major companies or organizations where they use me as an in-house coach, basically, is that they they say, oh, Joe really needs to work on rolling his eyes in meetings <laughs> or not listening to people or whatever it may be. Joe needs to step up his game. Um, and so I'll, I'll then meet with Joe and say, okay, where, where, what do you want to do? And does Joe, is Joe aware of what he wants to work on? And it's fun because I do not work with crisis situations. So in other words, somebody saying, well, we're about to fire this guy, but we're going to give him one more chance. And, and, uh, and I always say that then I'm probably not the right person for you. I'm, I'm really about somebody says, I need, I need to crack this code. I need somebody to help me. I need another resource. And I need somebody who is objective and outside of the organization. So I have 50% of my business comes from my organizational clients. How nice is that for an organization to value an employee enough to hire somebody like you? Right. Well, and what I always say at the beginning is that you're being invested in. You, this is a, it's personal development. Some people go, well, did they send me to a class? When they, when I'm hired to work with uh, an individual, it's really like having a personal trainer for leadership development. And then it's personal and pinpointed and specific. And once I start to work with somebody in an organization, it's confidential. I don't, none of the work that I do with the individual, I do not report back to anybody. Right. And uh, before we get into the, the next uh, section of our talk, I do want to mention also that you do strategic planning for organizations and we've even worked with you in food business school for <laughs> some of that. And yes building and those kind of things, which is a, a, another part of your business that's really yeah. valuable for organizations. And it's, and yeah, products. it's, uh, I've been blessed to be, to have worked with um, CIA since when, 2000, when did, when did a pro, pro chef start? 2001, 2002? Yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, I, I've been blessed to work with the organization and, and uh, especially with the business school. All right, so let's get into some of the meat of this conversation, which I know people are anxious to hear about, which are the key attributes of a great leader. And uh, I think you wanted to start with emotional intelligence. It's, uh, yes, I do. So that's, I'm, I'm gonna say the first and most important attribute of great leaders are people who understand emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence has been tossed around and people go, oh, do you know about emotional intelligence? And everybody says, oh, yeah, I know about that. Well, emotional intelligence, to take it down to the bare minimum, is really the space between when something happens, and I'm trying to line my, my hands up with the camera. There it is. When something happens and how you choose to respond. That space is really the measure of your emotional intelligence. 
so the there this this model you're seeing comes from emotional intelligence 2.0 uh, i recommend it highly there's also an assessment in it um and and it's just four quadrants your personal competence is what is your self-awareness some people think that they uh they don't you know that they are very open and authentic and genuine and really people read them as closed and unapproachable so having a great self-awareness is the foundation then self-management so a lot of times especially in the hospitality industry we're very passionate um so and that passion can't get misconstrued for reaction so a lot of times people will the old the old thought of the chef throwing the cleaver in the kitchen is is well he was passionate no he wasn't he was out of control so understanding self awareness self management and then your social competence is your social awareness do you understand those people you interact with whether it be a guest or whether it be an employee or whether it be your boss or whether it be your peers do you are you aware of your social environment um and then how do you build relationships so the first and most important attribute for great leaders is that they understand the power of emotional intelligence um the second one is and it's kind of a toss up on this one but the the number number 2 attribute i point out is to be a master of communications all right that the the most disconnects that happen with individuals and the most disconnects that happen in organizations all happen around communications so when i get asked what's the number thing you number one thing you work on with with companies it always has to do with their communications how open do they communicate how openly do they communicate how openly do they listen how openly does it you know are people interacting and is it riddled with politics and we're in such a great time right now to understand what poor communications <laughs> looks like and what great communications looks like um So communications would be my number 2. My number 3 is what I call conscious curiosity. And that's not uh there's there's a great coach down in Texas who calls calls out the difference between knowers and learners. And you could be in any organization, any relationship, any meeting and you can start to identify those people who act like they know everything and those people who are there to learn something so knowers are always giving answers and learners are always giving questions so being a conscious curiosity um i have one ceo who i can't keep up with in what he's reading and uh and and it's because he's just ra- a ravenous learner and the organization is a ravenous learner so um certainly conscious curiosity and an avid lifelong learner is is critical uh the fourth one and again i it's really hard for me to sequence these but empathy and understanding i mean you can be a gonging symbol or you can be beating the drum but if you don't understand your audience if you don't understand who you're talking to if you don't understand their needs if you don't understand their pain uh you really miss out on the ability to understand how to communicate you and so empathy is all about understanding the other person and the other person's point of view. You don't have to agree with the other person, but you definitely have to understand the other person. And then the the final one is balance and reflection. And this this 
came to me much later. Because when you're early in your career, you are all about competition. You're all about doing more than anybody else. You're all about achieving higher. You're all about putting in more hours. Uh, you're all about, did were you there on Saturday and Sunday? Were you there seven days a week? Were you there, you know, whenever? And, and it's, it's become obvious that that does not serve individuals or organizations well. So I'm beginning to see core values come up in individuals and in organizations that starts talking about balance. Do we have balance? Do we provide balance? Um, I'll never forget what a shock it was when uh, I think in the old days, Restaurants Unlimited said, our managers will have two days off in a row. And that was kind of a standard HR practice. I don't know if they're still doing it, but it really made me wake up to, whoa, this is, it's not, it's a lot more than just the daily schedule. I, I had a, a group I worked with last month that the chef was working seven days a week. It's really tough to bring your whole self to work if you're there seven days a week. So balance and reflection. And you also mentioned uh, earlier in our conversation before this we started, authentic humility. Ah, very good, thank you. Uh, I missed it, thank you. Uh, yes, <laughs> authentic humility. So get that word authentic because so often people have faux humility. I have a whole organization that they're experts at faux humility. Oh, I just was wondering about, or I was just, or we need to consider, or what? But they don't want to. They're just going to power through it anyway. And authentic, um, authentic humility is one that, <coughs> excuse me, is wrapped around really understanding how to understand. So authentic humility is that, that again, goes back to that knower versus learner. If you are a lifelong learner, you will be, you will have authentic humility. But identifying it and what it shows up like and what it looks like is, is most important to those people around you. So of these, these different attributes. How do you, as a coach, identify them and uh, build skills in these areas? Do people can, I'm assuming, develop and build skills to become great leaders, um, taking into consideration these attributes? They don't have to be necessarily born with them. They can they can develop them throughout their career and through working with someone like you. So how would you identify these in an, in a client and then maybe give an example of how you went yeah. through building yeah. the skills in those areas. So if you want to um, move to the disc um, slide, okay. I, I use um, a few different assessments to help people develop their self-awareness. Um, my job is not to judge or evaluate. My job is to help people understand their natural attributes and to, and, to, and to build on them. So the DISC model is one of the ones I use. Um, I'm sure people have heard of various, um, various assessments, and almost all of them have four quadrants. It's hysterical. But DISC is a, a model that's not built on personality or psychological model, it's built on behaviors. How do you show up to others? And it's like, I, I love to watch it because it's like I could have had a V8. Oh my gosh, how did it know that was me? Um, so what you see here, and it will be in, I, I think it's, you'll have access to it after the, after this conversation. Um, but it has four basic um, styles. One is results oriented. One is relationship oriented. One is team oriented. 
and one is analytical. Um, and that those are the four basic quadrants that people fall into. And then they have all sorts of combinations. So I will start with helping a client go through that assessment and then debrief them on how does that show up for them? What does it and how does it show up to others? Because it can be an attribute or depending on how you, it, you can be in shape with your style or you can be out of shape with your style. So that uh, a D who drives for results and they are all about getting things done. And getting things done by delegating and collaborating is great. That's called in-shape Ds. Out of shape Ds, you will all recognize this one. Out of shape Ds are the ones who just steamroll over everybody. You're gonna do it this way because I said so. All right, so there's in shape and out of shape and to help people develop that awareness and that ability to manage their own is, is probably one of the greatest, um, one of the greatest things that I get to be involved with. Because what I'm really doing is helping people understand a tool and use that tool to be a better leader and to, and to integrate it in how they communicate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it works really well for teams right. as well, right? For people to understand each other's styles and how they can better communicate within each, within a team with each other. Right, right. So assessment is how I work with individuals on that. Um, then we develop different types of plan strategies, um, uh, uh, action steps that people will take to implement. So a lot of times, so I, my, my process is I talk to people on the phone and, uh, and it's about once a week and I'll give them homework to do. And maybe I'll ask them to talk to their boss. Maybe I'll say, ask a couple of your peers how you show up doing this. Or ask them what if they could give you one thing to work on, what would they give you? And it's great because it allows people to start to have real conversation, not just the candy-coated ones that we all do in in the atmosphere of certain organizations. Yeah, that's such great, such great information and advising because it's just so important for people to understand each other like you're saying in an authentic way and realize how they're and and, and people to understand how they're being interpreted yeah, by others exactly great um, maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, one of your exciting programs which is developing a personal brand right and what is that what is that program and how do people benefit from so it's very fun when I, a lot of times I'll, I'll have people, people will say, I want you to work with, with George because um, I want him to have more executive presence. Um, you notice I always use guys. That's only because, you know, a lot of women already have their act together. No, I'm kidding. It's just, you know, that what is it that is your essence? And what is it that, whether it's a personal, whether it's an executive presence, whether it's how you communicate, whatever it is, it is your personal brand. So when we talk about CIA, I think that what's the, what's the, what's the uh, phrase excellence that includes excellence? What is it? Uh, you mean our yeah, core values? Yeah. It's, it's that you are dedicated to excellence, right? So that's the brand of CIA. CIA doesn't do um, things in a mediocre way. We don't do things for the masses. We don't do things for, you know, so that would be CIA. Let's say we talk about Apple and I asked you, what, what do you think, the, what are the key indicators of the, of the brand of Apple? And people will say innovative, user friendly. So they'll give you a bunch of words. So if I say, tell me about Kathy Joran, and people will say, um, detail oriented, very committed, dedicated. So they, so we all have a brand 
a lot of times we don't understand what our brand is. We think we do. Sometimes we mess it up with our personality, but that there is a very distinct way that companies develop their brand. And, and I love to say they also have logo cops, you know, but they have brand police who say that's off brand. Right. That's off message. Right. We aren't going to do that. We can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll work with I'll work with an individual and we will identify their brand so we will come up with their brand words dedicated loyal high achiever whatever and they will be very different everybody kind of thinks oh well they're going to be the same well that's because you're thinking from your head that you think everybody's going to have what you have as your brand words but they they are as different as night and day um, then we actually work on a brand statement. So that in that statement, brand words are what you use when you describe yourself. Your brand statement becomes your true north. So your brand statement is really about what, what is it that's most important about Debbie Benedetti, right? So it was funny. I was at a I was at a cocktail party and one CEO was introducing me to another CEO and he said, you have to work with Debbie. She's great. Da, da, da. And this new person got in my face and said, well, why? What do you do? And I looked right back at him. And of course, you have to have a quick answer. And I said, I support your success. And that really has kind of become my true north. I have to test myself. Am I supporting in individual success, am I supporting a company's success? Have they defined what their success looks like? But that's my job. My job is to support their success. My job is to is to is to deliver on that. Um, and then uh, we also come up with brand messages. Uh, I support your success would be one of them. Um, I help others achieve their greatest potential. So that you as an individual, when you're done going through the brand, um, the brand develop your personal brand development and you have your personal brand work, you know what words you use to describe yourself, you know what messages you use to describe yourself, and everybody's really clear. It's like we're really clear that Apple's about innovation, right? We're really clear that that Starbucks is about creating community, right? They're about nurturing and inspiring. Um, so that individuals get really clear and that it's always hysterical when they all of a sudden hear others repeating back to them their brand words. Well, you're so innovative or you're so supportive or whatever it may be. You're so creative. And it's things that people hadn't done before. Um, so it's very important that, um, that people identify, define, and then utilize what their personal brand words are, their personal brand messages are. That way it's also, somebody asked me, how did you start doing that? And I, I, I thought back to this panel that I heard talking about um, making sure that people understand what your interests are and, and, and ensuring that what they say about you when you aren't in the room, not when you are in the room, but understanding what you say, they say about you when you aren't in the room. And if your brand is solid and clear and clean, People will will use that when they talk about you in a in a promotion evaluation or in a referral evaluation or in an entrepreneur situation that they will say, oh, that person's got more energy than life itself. And that energy is a part of somebody's brand. But yeah. So when people start working with you on this and you initially they initially talk about what they think their brand is, or they hear about others' perceptions of them. They, they may, may not be happy with what their brand is, and they can change that 
that and develop that by working with you. Is that yeah? Correct? It's interesting. I I am um, I probably should uh, and I'll and Kathy, I'll I'll send this to you later. But the one of the things I do is I have them do a worksheet. So it's not about what is your personal brand, but I start with this worksheet that says, you know, what are your strengths? Now, some people, and and here's what, <laughs> consider your personal and professional life and your personal brand is with you 24 seven. That's the instruction. My strengths mm -hmm. are, that's the first question, right? Mm -hmm. I can get mm -hmm. like three words here. And it, it just blows me away that people, people again, working on your self-awareness, understanding that what are their greatest strengths. So then we'll work through that and it will become 10, 15 that are people's greatest, what their strengths are. What are their competencies? What are they really good at? And they amaze themselves. Um, then the next question is, I'm in my bliss when I'm X, right? So again, what makes you happy? What is what is happiness? The third one is my greatest accomplishments. And of course, that's all that's milestones. So I've had everywhere from the state track star to um you know, my daughter being born or PhD. Um, I know yours, Kathy, is, if I had to guess, it's probably getting your master's because you work so hard on it. Um, but what are your key milestones? And then the fourth one is, what am I best known for? And that's a hard one for, for people when they say, when I say, what are you best known for? Well, you know that I'm, and sometimes people will only put um, work will only identify work, and I will say no. I want you to identify work and personal because your brand is with you 24/7. And uh, so we start with that worksheet, and then from there we we develop the personal uh, brand words and brand messages. And it can take two, three, four sessions to get it. Um, and the final one, and I'll I'll just. It, I don't know. Did we ever do a full personal brand? I oh, okay. Um, but one of the things that one client started talking to me one day about giraffes and, and her love of giraffes. And I thought, oh, isn't this interesting? And so I started adding, what animal do you respond to or do you most relate to? And again, when I look at their brands, their brand words or their brand statement, it's two dimensional. We add an animal to it and sometimes it's their dog. Sometimes uh, one person had bird of prey was their, was the animal they most related to. Some people have, a have had a sea turtle. Uh, it, it just, and then they talk about it for, you know, a few minutes on why why do they relate to that that specific animal? It sounds kind of crazy, but it really helps them identify to those brand words and brand messages they have. So it's kind of fun. Anyway, I, I've had people call me in five years from the time we worked with them and say, you just need to know that I just got the best job of my life and it was because of my personal brand. Yeah, it's very fun. It's what I do is fun work. I mean, I don't I don't do ugly work. I get I get to do fun work, and that's really helping people understand their potential. Nice and seeing them succeed. Um, how does the personal brand differ from a personal strategic plan? So another thing I've done over the years are personal strategic plans, and those are a little more in depth. Brand is really that, that thing that identifies your essence. A personal strategic plan I designed after doing so many organizational strategic plans. And again, it just digs down deeper into how you want to achieve something. So the personal strategic plan includes, um, first and foremost, a vision statement. 
Um, and that usually is developed when the individual has developed uh, what their core values are. So integrity, honesty, service, you know, people identify core values, why they do what, what they do. Why, what drives them? What are their drivers? What makes them want to do something? Um, so understanding your core values and your drivers is usually the first step. From there, mm -hmm. we, we work together in developing a vision statement. And the vision statement is who do you want to be at your best, right? Who you want to be at your best. So it, it may be as simple as contributing to the bigger, to the greater good of the, of the, of the, of the, of the industry are contributing to the greater good. One, like mine is helping others uh, to reach their greatest potential. That's who I am at my best. Do I do that every day? No. Am I always good at it? Well, I hope to with my clients. I may not always be great at it at home. <laughs> or I may get very, uh, where were we? Anyway, we, I may get very off, off target at supporting people's greatest potential. Um, then we do what, if you've been through any strategic plan, we do that this whole layout is the same as the layout of a, a strategic, a normal strategic plan, is that we do a SWOT. Mm -hmm. And that is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and I have, I have adopted trends as opposed to the threats. So what are your strengths? What do you do well? How do you, how do you act at your best? You know that internally, you, maybe nobody else knows it, but you know it. These are internal strengths. What are your weaknesses? In other words, what are your blind sides? How do you act under stress? I get a little cranky, you know. How do you act under stress? I become abrupt. Um, I may not listen as well as I should. Again, this is personal strategic plan, not necessarily what I do with my work. Um, opportunities are external alternatives. So if I'm looking at, um, I want to be more educated on, on emotional intelligence. So I want to take, you know, I want to think, I want to get more education in that area. There are opportunities for me to serve in the community. Here are op opportunities and options to consider. And then trends are external opportunities for future shifts in direction. So if I am an executive coach right now, what could be the opportunities for me to expand that? So every organization, every individual wants to go through a SWOT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and trends. From there, you develop what are my strategic initiatives, more education, whatever it may be, and then SMART goals. So it's really a plan. I typically say it, it lasts three years and that you update it on a, ever on a three year basis. Some people, some people, some organizations roll it on a 12 month basis. They review it every 12 months. But the personal strategic plan is really about, are you on target with what you say? And as we all know, when you're younger, you kind of bounce. I'm going to try this, then I'm going to try that, and then I'm going to try this. There should be some sequence to it. There should be some organization to it, some systemization. Yeah, some some system to it. And so a personal strategic plan helps you do that. Get a sense of direction and be able to fall back on that when you when you make decisions or re, or consult with that when you make decisions and, and make those in accordance with your strategic right. plan and with your personal brand. Right, right, right. So uh, in our last few minutes here, are the, there any books that you would recommend for people to consult in terms of leadership? Yeah, I, uh, I, I and you're going to be, everybody's going to be provided. Let me just run through them real quickly. Uh, the top part are corporate 
culture and effectiveness. I know that you have a lot of entrepreneurs. Uh, I always, when I'm working with entrepreneurs, make sure you have your cultural foundation before you start your company. I've got a great chocolate. Cool. What's your, how are you going to, how are you going to treat your people? <laughs> um, who moved my cheese is all about change management. First break of all the rules is again about culture. So culture is important. It says corporate culture, but it's organizational culture. And then your personal leadership, which we've jumped into today. Um, the power of Ted is a game changing book. It's a, it's a parable. It's, it's really about how relationship dynamics affect how you communicate. Emotional intelligence, we talked about, seven habits, old book, great, great uh, information. Servant leader uh, is all about how do you learn to serve. Uh, now discover your strengths is that piece of self-awareness. And then our own hero, Cheryl Batchelder, who was the CEO that turned around Popeyes, uh, has one that's called Dare to Serve. Those are the ones I would recommend highly. So I will send out this uh, these slides to everyone with the videotape of this uh, conversation so that you can all access those and don't have to try and write them down at the moment. <laughs> that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Jenny. Okay. So uh, in a final uh, question here, what would be one piece of advice you would give to emerging leaders if you had to just choose one thing to leave to leave our audience with today? Um, very definitely, it would be about self-awareness and understand who you are, understand how you show up to others, and understand what makes you unique and own it. And that really brings your authenticity to the table and really helps you in every relationship, personally and professionally. That'd be it. Okay. Thank you so you much. Bet. Lovely spending time with you this morning. And I uh, really appreciate your time and your sharing your expertise with our listeners you today. And thank you, you so bet. much. And we'll, we'll I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave now, right? I'm leaving now. <laughs> Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone stay on for just a minute and I'll tell you about our upcoming programs. So our next Good Biz Plus session is taking place on July 25th. And this session is going to be with uh, Dr. Taylor Reed, who is a faculty member at the CIA in Hyde Park. He teaches uh, courses on food systems and farm to table, he has an incredible uh, diverse background, but he is also going to to, uh, has some expertise and is going to talk about biodiversity in the professional kitchen and how important biodiversity is today in terms of the challenges that we're facing in our industry and uh, with um, the environment and with being able to feed the world over the next 20, 30, 40 years. So please join us for that uh, Food Biz plus Biodiversity in the Professional Kitchen on July 25th. You register for that uh, like you did this one on our foodbusinessschool.org website. Additionally, I'd like to mention that we are launching three new uh, online short courses for executive education. Anyone can sign up for these. They're uh, taking place from July 15th to August 18th, and they are self-paced. So once you sign up, the content will be released weekly and you can work on it uh, as you like. There'll be discussion board forums so you can interact with your fellow learners. But uh, they're all taught by uh, fabulous experts who are faculty in our master's degree program. So you'll get a little taste of what we offer in that program as well. And you can uh, the links to signing up for these are also on our foodbusinessschool.org website. But um, if you want to take all three of them, you save a little money, but each one is a very reasonable $149. So we wanted to offer these as opportunities for gleaning some very uh, valuable information from these faculty members uh, to audiences that uh, are looking to gain these skill sets. Then finally, I do want to mention our Master Professional Studies in Food Business program, which launched last year. It's a two-year online primarily asynchronous program that can be uh, taken from anywhere in the world 
it uh, has uh, it's designed for people who are working professionals full time. So it's manageable for full time workers. It's uh, as I mentioned, primarily online and asynchronous. But there are three residencies that are a part of this program: the beginning, the middle, and the end that are short, three to five day residencies on our CIA campuses. And we are accepting applications right now for our next cohort, which starts in August with the residency and September with online courses. That uh, cohort is nearly full. So if anyone is interested in applying, please go to the foodbusinessschool.org website where you'll, you'll find a direct link to this uh, program site and application information. But uh, we have 22 students in our current cohort who just finished their second residency at our Hyde Park campus last week. They've become a very cohesive cohort. They all have business uh, plans, uh, ideas in place for moving forward for their second year and developing their final capstone project, which is a business plan playbook. So if any of you are interested in starting a business, either in a restaurant or food service application or developing a new food product that you'd like to launch into the market, this program is for you. It's also for people who are working within organizations and corporations who want more education about food business to either move up in the organization or to develop a new innovative department or product or uh, any kind of innovative um, project within an organization. So it's for, for both entrepreneurs and what we call intrapreneurs of organizations. This is the direct link to this uh, site as well, ciachef.edu forward slash masters. And as I mentioned, you can get to it through the foodbusinessschool.org website as well. So thank you all for joining me today, and thanks uh, to Debbie for joining us. I hope you found this conversation valuable, and we will again send out 